It's not actually a free choice about whether or not you verify yourself. From a, a legal perspective, you know, with, with anonymity, is there that thing that there are things you wouldn't do in public life, not only because, you know, they would contravene good manners and the way we all behave with each other, but also in real life, we'd count them as hate speech or you'd count them as, um, you know, actually going at, at breaking laws. And the moment you do it anonymously online, it's fine. Nobody, nobody's calling it out. You can't be called out. Called out. Well, you can, obviously, you, you can be called out and the platforms, uh, you know, do close down. I mean, they're getting much, much better at, clo close, they at closing down. They at closing can't down. hold you accountable for it. But they, you're right, they can't hold you accountable. But the, the police can investigate. But, you know, using VPNs or whatever, you can, it's quite, it's quite easy to cloak, uh, 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 cloak your identity. And I mean, I've I've come across cases where you know quite sophisticated abusers set up um, attack sites where where that they they completely you know, impossible to find out who they are, um, and 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 you can actually cause a hell of a lot of damage if you do it carefully and subtly. And, and they've done that, and you know there is no remedy. No way of holding accountable. Yeah, and just I mean. On the example, so 4chan, for instance, I, I, from the perspective of my campaign, I'm a bit less concerned about something like 4chan because it seems to me, you know, there are victims and volunteers. Those are people who, who they know what they're getting into. I'm more concerned about the likes of Facebook, Twitter, the, those that are really our sort of virtual public square, the places that people are being driven out of because, um, because of the abuse they get. And it seems unreasonable. That they, so I think we should have a, a high level of protection and that's the, that's what the online safety bill is trying to do, is to get you know give us a high level of protection for the for the major sites that we almost need to be on these days. And the other distinction is between we're talking about legal but harmful. Yeah. Here. So uh, some of the stuff we're talking about hate speech and that that is a crime. So that of course gets treated in a different way. What we're talking about more is bullying, harassment, disinformation, the stuff that we're never going to criminalise, but we nevertheless need to try to give us the tools. You mentioned friction. Yeah. Our proposal introduces friction. That's what it does. Just on the verification point, I'd be interested to know... Well, kind of uh, be before you, you, you do, uh, Stephen, could you just set out exactly how this verification model would work so that people understand if, if it comes into to action, how their lives would change? How, how would their, their use of the internet change? Yeah, I, I should say as a starting point, we're very concerned. We didn't, we didn't want verification to become another huge trove of data for the large platforms that they can use to, to, to monetize us and, and target us with advertising. So there are some very good third party verification solutions out there and the, for instance, one company called One ID, they rely on the data you've already given to your bank. In the UK, 98% of us have, have online banking or access to it. We've already verified ourselves to them. So we're not looking for us all to have to, again, upload our passport or our driving license and give more data to the platforms. There are secure ways that you having done it once, you can then use the way you verified yourself to that third party provider. You can then use that to open your online account or your social media account. Are, are tech platforms keen on these systems, though? I mean, are the financial benefits for them? Surprisingly not. No. no. <laughs> I mean, not, talk, talk not, us through not this. So talk us far. through how the model uh, at the moment favours them and what, how they're profiting from anonymity. Well, uh, they profit in a number of ways. Obviously, they profit from anonymity because uh, abuse, toxic discussion, drives engagement, uh, keeps people on the site longer. That's one way. The other, of course, the fact that so many of the accounts out there are fake and, and you see, I mean, Elon Musk is concerned that Twitter might have more than 5% fake accounts. We think the figure is somewhere between 15 and 30%. People say it's, that's true of Facebook as well. But they are still selling those fake eyeballs to advertisers. So, and we don't know because we can't get access to the data. I mean, one of the things that the bill and other legislation wants to do is make these platforms at least give access to the data to researchers so that we can form a truer picture of what's really going on. But I think there are so many ways. After all, they could make these changes now. If they cared about the user experience as much as they do, or say they do, if they cared, cared about us as citizens as much as they say they do, they could introduce a lot of changes that would improve our lives online. Victoria, I mean, do, do you see that a system like verification would be um, acceptable. So yeah, on kind of verification specifically, um, I'm interested to know your perspective of the critique of verification that it risks potentially giving users a false sense of security in that unless platforms also have real name policies where you 
like you have proven to a platform that the name you were using on a website is exactly the same as the name that you've verified yourself at. It's like, unless platforms use those, which on the whole, they've tried to introduce, they don't work. They, again, it's like trans people who change their name, celebrities who want to have a private account in a different name, teachers who want to hide who they are. Like there are too many like groups who really legitimately just shouldn't be using their real names or whatever a real name is. Like, so unless it goes hand in hand with real name systems, doesn't it risk providing users a false sense of security that, oh, this person verified themselves, but like we don't actually know if the name that they verified to the platform is the name that they're showing us, that the pictures that they're showing the platform is the pictures that they're showing us. And the verification is just another thing that will, like it will also be abused. I think that that's a fair concern. I mean, I, ideally I'd like to see a cascade where right at the top, we verified not only your name, but your location. Also that we verified any claim you make about yourself. If I look on Twitter, the number of people who claim to be ex-forces, I mean, how big was our army? <laughs> All these ex-nurses, all these ex-vets. I mean, so I would like to, but I could also imagine at a lower tier of protection, we say, well, all I, I just need to know you're a real person. I don't need to know who you are. I don't need to know the claims you make about yourselves are true. But at the top, yes, we would certainly say real name uh, as an option. Again, we're just talking about my right to say, I want to screen out very, I have a cascade of risk levels and I want to set my tolerance for risk in terms of who I'm willing to deal with. So, so this would be a system where users could decide that you don't just don't, don't want to engage with anyone who hasn't been fully verified, yeah. who you can't be sure is a real person. And you user. could turn it on or off. So you might have put something out that you know is going to get a bit of a backlash. You think, well, I'll, I'll dial it down for a few weeks until that passes. And then I'll... Every time you leave one of these talks. Just exactly. Like, <laughs> yeah. Nobody who isn't verified can, yeah. can message you. Can... I, with that, is there a risk that you kind of create like a kind of two tier of internet users because it's not actually a free choice about whether or not you verify yourself, right? Because the assumption is that if you haven't, like, oh, like good people are gonna verify themselves. Therefore, if you haven't verified yourself, like there's probably something dodgy going on. And like, even if you have concerns about like where your data is going, whether or not that's justified in the way that the system's set up, if you just have an issue with the principle of it, aren't you actually gonna be kind of, isn't there a coercion happening there into verifying yourself? Everything has a risk of unintended consequences. One of the accounts that I like and follow is called The Secret Barrister, and the clue is in the name. Incredibly popular, has huge reach. Yeah. Um, Hugh, where do you stand on this system of verification? I think the problem is that the people like Stephen, who are concerned about these issues, and perhaps many people in the audience would take advantage of the system, but it requires effort. and, and you know, 80% of people aren't going to do it. Uh, uh, and so you, you get a small number of, of clean, verified people communicating with each other. And then you get the rest of the world uh, uh, spewing out hate speech, disinformation, and so on as before. So the, the, the you know, anything that requires people to, th to think, to engage, to, to take positive steps is going to have a, a massive fallout rate inevitably. Though so actually we, we did polling with YouGov and Compassion in Politics did polling through Opinion and they found that 80% of people will do it. It no, actually no, is 80%. 80% of people said, said they would do it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Often True. a different thing. <laughs> Reveal um, preference, yeah. And, and Hugh, I mean, do you think the financial incentives for big tech companies are just so high? that it's almost impossible now to, to reverse the situation, to, to end anonymity, which, which you'd like to see? Oh, the, the, the financial incentives for, I mean, I mean, I agree with everything that Stephen said. I mean, there's no doubt that anonymity is financially beneficial to the big tech companies, but the big tech companies do what they told. I mean, it, it's that they, they can tweak their system in any any way they want. I mean, I, I always tell people the story. I once had a case against Google where my client was being subject to all kinds of vile abuse and, and Google effectively said they could do nothing about it. Like, t technically impossible, they said. We said, you know, okay, we sued them. Case went on for six months. The week before the trial, they said, actually, you know, not only is it technically possible, but actually it won't cost us anything. <laughs> so, so you know, they were able to do. Now, if you said to the tech companies, "You have to do this, otherwise you can't operate in the UK," they would do it. So, yes, it's not in their financial interest, but in in the end, it's 
it, it's more in their financial interest to, to, to do it than uh, to not operate in the UK at all. Mm. Stephen, is there a danger, you know you've looked at this a lot, but is there a danger that if you do force these big tech companies to adopt this, if you do end anonymity as much as you can online, that you just force more and more people into effectively the dark web, into the less regulated versions of, of tech platforms? Uh, obviously, I mean, our, propo our proposal won't force anyone to do anything because we're again, we're focusing on rights. So we're simply saying, uh, yes, everyone will still have the right to be anonymous and they'll have the right to exercise their free speech anonymously. However, we're going to balance that. So they will have their free speech, but I'm going to have a right not to be shouted at. So we won't be driving anybody anywhere. I do agree with you on sort of the financial incentives for the platforms it is a question, though equally, um, the UK is such a big digital market that it's going to be very hard. And we've, you know, how many times we heard companies and platforms say, well, if you change the rules in a way we don't like, we're going to leave. I mean, other than the, with the example of China, that doesn't really happen. There is another constituency, though, that also doesn't want change, that likes the status quo, and that's our press. Because they, in the Online Safety Bill, have argued so far for a carve-out, so that these rules shouldn't apply to them or to their websites, from which increasingly they make a, a great deal of their money. So, I mean, just, just explain that to the yeah. audience, why, why the press would want slightly different rules. Well, the, the press always want different rules. I mean, yes. You know, that, that's, As a journalist, I can vouch for that. Exactly. Um, they, uh, what's their real case? I, I suppose they again say it's free speech. They say uh, we as journalists ought to be able to, to you know, without fear or favour. Um, but they extend that to their websites. And of course, that wouldn't be such a problem if we had effective press regulation. I mean, most other industries, generally, if they, they can persuade the government to back off because they have you know, effective self-regulation. We don't in the case of the press. So it is a worry, but this is you know, this huge pushback, I should say, from MPs from all parties on this. And there's very, every opportunity for you all to add your voices if you're also concerned that we shouldn't allow the press to behave, carry on behaving in this way online and on their comments pages. Um. I mean, in a way, anonymity is one of those issues where you won't have the same problem with the press because I've never met a journalist who doesn't want a byline. Well, um, well no, no, sorry, the trouble is not just the, it's the, it's the um, comment section. Yes. Yeah. So, so, so the bizarre thing is, is, is that the comment sections are going to be entirely unregulated. So, so as people have pointed out, if, if I have a Twitter account, which I don't, uh, 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 with, with five followers, I'm subject to Ofcom. Uh, the Daily Mail with 60 million yeah. uh, viewers is, is not regulated at all in relation to its comment. And the other thing is, sorry to go on about this, but the other thing is that the way that the government have defined the press, I can just set up a, something called a newspaper uh, 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 and I can publish anything I like and it's unregulated. Mm. Which is terrifying. To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.